Good afternoon. This is Joel Dutrich from the Arthritis and Clinical Neurology Program at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. Today I'm going to talk about our experiences uh, adapting uh, a research technology uh, to emergency testing for SARS-CoV-2. And we're using Fluidyme's microfluidic gene expression platform. So Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, our typical use for these technologies is our research programs. And we're leaders in autoimmune disease research, in particular lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, and rheumatoid arthritis, where we look at genetic association studies, functional genomics, and mechanistic studies. And we use both in, uh, next generation sequencing platforms as well as microfluidic platforms for variant or SNP analysis as well as transcriptomics. However, in March of 2020, uh, this year, um, there was a state of emergency declared in Oklahoma for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, pandemic. And the, this paved the way for trying to expand testing capabilities and leveraging the use of traditionally research equipment for clinical testing. So what are these barriers to expanding testing? Um, Predominantly, these barriers revolve around supply chain limits. Um, these can be limits on the suitable swabs for testing, the suitable transport media to transport samples, um, the plastics and consumables, the tips, PCR plates, et cetera, the extraction kit reagents, magnetic beads, quantity isothiocyanate, or the real-time PCR reagents, such as reverse transcriptase or the reverse transcriptase master mix. All of these have, to some degree, we have found to have supply chain limits um, where manufacturers prioritize certain regions or hotspots to get these particular materials. So preferences are also given to state designation testing sites. So even within a state, you could have testing sites competing with one another. And this sets up this competition between states, between testing centers, and with the national government and Department of Defense for actual getting the supplies needed to carry out expanded testing. So this also, when this uh, uh, emergency declaration was uh, issued, it also provided collaborative opportunities for us. Um, because we had research equipment, um, there was a mandate to try to expand technologies to use that research equipment in broader screening approaches for clinical testing. There was also emergency use authorizations and waiver of CLIA requirements for testing. And because of these two things, we actually reached out, since we had the equipment for research from Fluidyme, we reached out to Fluidyme to inquire whether or not there were any efforts underway to utilize that Biomark platform for the IDT CDC SARS-CoV-2 um, assay that had already had emergency use authorization. And this started about uh, March 23rd of this year. So this collaboration started um, and it rapidly developed as an effort to develop and move towards an FDA EUA for a lab developed test um, that was be based on this technology in our high complexity CLIA laboratory. So Ormer F and Fluidyme had set up a collaboration. We also brought in OU Medicine, which is where our existing virology laboratory performing standard testing and the medical technology staff was housed, as well as the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, where our pathologist, clinical informatics, uh, where we had a BSL-3 emergency pathog emerging pathogen lab, as well as connections to the Oklahoma State Department of Health. So this collaborative group, as I said, was moving towards development and rapidly trying to put together an FDA EUA application for this technology to expand testing. So development constraints for this can, uh, candidate test were things that we could put into place. We could change um, what we thought we needed to focus on. So part of the constraints we did was we tried to do this in a way where we would only use reagents and supplies that were less affected by the supply chain. Um, there were, of course, many time constraints, both external pressure to develop quickly, um, which we had to uh, accommodate. We also were looking at things that must be cost effective, but also scalable. Unfortunately, there, there has been 
and continues to be a real lack of clarity and a moving target on the amount of testing that ideally needs to be done versus that which will be done. Um, we keep getting, and everybody does, um, this moving target of we need to do thousands of tests a day to we need to be doing more than thousands of tests a day. So the other thing that we constrained this development effort to was that we must be able to work across a range of sample types. The traditional nasopharyngeal swab um, in universal transport media is uh, the traditional way. However, because of availability, we found that many uh, sample collecting sites also started using their own versions of viral transport media. Uh, they are just using saline for some of these. And now we're also seeing saliva or other types of upper respiratory tract sampling methods being used. And ideally, this platform should be able to work across all those sample types if possible. And in fact, um, for an FDA requirement, um, you have to focus on the most complex or the most difficult type of sample that you're going to obtain when you're determining your uh, performance of your test. So we also, we focused on what something that would be compatible with a CLIA CAP lab developed test from a high complexity CLIA lab uh, so that we could apply directly to the, for an EUA from the FDA. And as I said, the FDA constraint was you must use the right sample, have the right specificity, and the right sensitivity to yield the right results greater than 95% of the time compared to other approved methods. Now, as we are developing this, we also realized that we needed to focus as well on the whole pipeline, not just the technology for the test. Um, because as a uh, testing site within the state, we needed to make sure that we had the right integration and automation, as well as the uh, right laboratory for management systems for this high throughput screening pipeline. This level of high throughput screening and testing was not the norm for a single test within most clinical labs. Um, we needed to integrate robotics um, because we needed to reduce the amount of human layer and human fatigue. And we needed that la uh, laboratory for management system for end-to-end -end data management and results reporting. So the scope of the project is kind of outlined on this slide where we are looking at everything from how we work with the collection sites, whether they be state or hospital collection sites, contract tracing, whatever, we need to be able to make sure that samples that are being collected in whatever media um, are barcoded and have the appropriate digital uh, personal health information um, associated with those samples collected and available such that when a sample comes to the lab, we have a lab registration process where the samples, when they're received, are entered into the limbs and tracked throughout the actual process. Initial steps in the process had to be extraction, and this had to be something where we could plate, uh, aliquots could be placed on 96 well plates and extraction of RNA performed. We had to go through the uh, DNA, some reverse transcriptase steps of the fluidine system, preamplification that was part of the fluidine system, the integrated fluidic cell loading, which is part of that system, as well as the detection in the lanolito qPCR. And any results then from the Biomark HD at this point needed to then be analyzed um, and processed to interpret it results that could then be reviewed by our clinical staff and then reported to the requesting physician or state health department or whoever uh, employer, whoever was requesting these tests. So this is that overview of the overall scope of the project. But as you can see, this is a fairly open type system. It's uh, very modular, uh, lots of different components, but it's not a closed system. When you look at um, comparing that, uh, the system we developed here, which is that open system, to a traditional lab test, most of the time, the tests that you get from a traditional test, um, let's say a tac path test, are typically self-contained technologies. There's kind of this black box. You place the sample in, 
You go through the process and then a result is coming out. All the reagents and controls and materials are included as kits, many of which then become supply chain limited because all clinical labs are trying to compete and use the same platforms. Um, it's designed for clinical lab implementation and operation already, so medical technologists are very familiar with the platform, so that is a good thing. Um, but it's not scalable in the same ways that a person would like to be scalable. Um, results are standardly analyzed and reported um, based upon the internal assay controls, and you don't have a lot of additional flexibility. When you take a research platform like we have developed here in the Oklahoma SARS-CoV-2 platform, it's modular. It's kind of a deconstructed technology. All the controls, reagents, and materials are supplied on a component basis, not necessarily as kits. So we can make our own uh, components that are based on the re extraction. We're not limited to a fully completed kit to do that. Um, it's designed for flexibility and robustness and reproducibility. We do more replicates on this platform than what a typical lab test does, where a sample may be tested in one well. Um, uh, it's a simple swap out of reagents or components if needed. If something becomes supply chain limited, we can usually find alternative sources to replace those. Um, and with a simple bridging study, be able to swap and move to those technologies. And the analysis can be tailored a little bit more. As I say, we have access to all the data and the lab development tests can be designed with different cutoffs, quality control, and key performance indicator metrics as that lab defines or feels is necessary. So the key points that we knew right up front were for refinement. Um, are shown here. First off, we're starting a point is this IDT, CDC, N1N2, SARS-CoV-2 test, which had an EUA. And this was already being worked with with the Fluidine Research and Development Team to change this TACMAN assay and adapt it to the Microfluidix um, Biomark HD platform. When we started working with the group, um, the Research and development team at Fluidine was focused on a direct lysis to RT type of methodology. And this would be non-standard to FDA. FDA was very specific in saying if using standard extraction and purification methods. So this was a little bit of a different uh, approach, and this is something we started working with the research and development team at uh, Fluidine. And as part of that, we also noticed that the one of the controls was having a farm, uh, which is a human RNA speed control, was having a little bit higher genomic background than that it was uh, we would like. Um, so we were adding in this high, um, uh, double stranded DNA specific DNA RT one step reaction protocol. And you know, this was something else that we were able to work in um, use of this very specific double stranded DNA specific DNA. Um, into that particular reaction to reduce the genomic background from the human uh, epithelial cells that are present in some of the samples that one does when you do nasopharyngeal swabs. So back to this RNA template, you know, as I said, we started with the direct lysis method to RT um, that was being worked on by the fluidine research and development. But we found, and we'll talk about the data in a few minutes, um, we also were hearing lots in the literature about, well, why don't we just do direct sample to RT? Again, not an approved method yet, and it's unclear of the sensitivity with real live coronavirus. Um, we were also um, looking at options for variations of the standard extraction and purification um, that are or are not supply chain limited. So again, more constructed uh, versus uh, kit versus lab obtained components. Um, these are things that we traditionally do in research um, is these kind of um, uh, extractions. So could we develop our own uh, lab developed extraction procedure that could also be used in this method? And there are also gonna be other places to refine would be variations in the controls, both process controls and internal controls to the assay. So, as I mentioned, we started looking at the lysis method for preparing a viral RNA template uh, 
extractions. And in this case, the lysis method is what Druidine Research and Development was initially working with. However, we found very quickly that there appeared to be a inhibition when you used samples that were collected in universal transport media, you started to see an inhibition of sensitivity much earlier um, in the, um, than you would when you used water only. Um, so there seemed to be something that was inhibiting the reverse transcriptase step um, when you use this method. The other thing that was apparent is we needed to have a, uh, if you did not include an uh, RNase inhibitor in this method, um, that any viral RNA would be rapidly degraded. So you're actually competing two things. One was RT inhibition, as well as um, the uh, RNA degradation uh, that would be present when you use various complex uh, universal transport medias. So we, as I said, we uh, also were looking at extraction methods. Um, and this is using a uh, known extraction method, using now nasopharyngeal swabs that were negative uh, and spiking in the BEI viral reference uh, genomic DNA or RNAs. And as you can see, in this type of a method using standard extraction, um, using that universal transport media, nasopharyngeal swab media, we did not see that inhibition. We were actually much more sensitive uh, to being able to detect the viral as well as the human RNA-SP control material. Furthermore, when we took a viral mimic, and this is a, uh, um, uh, a mimic of SARS-CoV-2, so it is a phage mimic that does not have uh, live virus, it's non-replicative virus, when you spike that in, to universal transport media, and now you have to do extraction. So we're not using the reference genome. You're using phage, so you must extract. You can still see good sensitivity and ability to detect well below the levels of what most standard assays are able to do um, when you're looking at your viral genomic uh, or viral genes for N1 and N2. So this now outlines what that extraction procedure looks like um, that we were going to use for our initial uh, EUA validation studies. Um, we start, settled on a extraction using a spin plate from Zymo um, that is uh, able to take 50 microliters of sample plus 50 microliters of their DNA RNA shield and then add 200 microliters of their viral buffer to carry out the extraction reactions. So these are done in plates, transfers to spin plates to do the washes and elution um, into an eluted RNA plate. So now you have 20 microliters of a viral RNA that has been purified. And the rest is now the standard um, assay that we would use for a Biomark HD type run, where we're taking a certain amount of extracted RNA plus a one-step DNA our uh, reverse transcriptase to make generator cDNA. After that, we go through preamplification with all of the probes, um, and then we go through and dilute that, and then do a setup of our um, integrated fluidic cell along now with the individual IDT probes or control probes um, in a 192 by 24 integrated fluidic cell which is then loaded onto the Juno microfluidic loading platform, and ultimately then um, RT-QPCR um, detection is carried out in the Biomark HD, which then goes on to into analysis. So as part of our FDA um, EUA data generation, we needed to now take that platform and apply it to um, a series of um, validation steps. And the first thing is to determine a preliminary range for your limited detection. And this we did with using the BEI um, extracted uh, viral genome with viral uh, spin plates, um, where we were titrating in the various range of the number of copies per mil of the viral genome 
and running three replicates each and then looking at how many of the replicates were actually able to be detected. And at what point did we start to see a drop in our ability to detect these particular viral genomes? And as you can see, our limit of detection is here around 160 uh, copies per mil or 0.16 copies per microliter. So this is actually one of the more sensitive ranges for an assay to be at, and that would be expected for something where we're doing a preamplification like we are with in the biomark system. As additional data then, once we've determined that a preliminary LOD, then we had to do the actual LOD uh, validation or final determinations. And to do this, you always carry out replicates. Um, where you've done contrived replicates um, at one times, two times, and four times the limit of detection. And so since our limit of detection was at 160 copies per mil, um, we did that 24 uh, replicates at that, 24 replicates at two times, and 54 replicates at four times the LOD. And as you can see, we're detecting 100% of these particular replicates when we look at each of these um, uh, tests. Cross-reactivity test is predominantly done by uh, looking at uh, in silico, uh, data uh, with the probes, which has already been done in the IDT and CDC EUA. However, we did go through and look at MIRS and SARS isolates, and also were able to show that the assay was sensitive and unable to pick up any of the uh, SARS and MIRS was not being cross-reactive or tested, uh, detected in this particular assay. So for our final data, um, uh, for this EUA, we did our clinical evaluations where we are taking known uh, samples, known positives and known negatives that have been tested by another laboratory on another platform, and we need to be able to detect at least a concordance of at least 95% or greater. And so we have 50 negative samples that were all in UTM media, and none of those were detected in the assay. For our known positives, we had 51 positives from the Oklahoma State Department of Health in, in universal transport media. We had another eight from a company called Viracor, another from a laboratory in Tulsa, um, an adjacent laboratory. Uh, another set were from the uh, University of Oklahoma uh, medical labs. And then another set were from the University of Arkansas uh, medical, for medical sciences in Little Rock. And you can see that we were able to detect 100% of the positives uh, as well. So the assay at that point looks like it is a very sensitive and very robust um, assay. And that's shown here when we look at those same results, now looking at the individual replicates. And one thing I should point out is that when we test, unlike knowing the clinical tests, we're actually t looking at five replicates. And each of those five replicates is also now, when we were doing this assay, we were doing replicates of those. So you can see very tight replicates of either our N1 detection um, for those that were all positive. These are the known positive samples. N2, as well as RNASP. And so, again, the uh, negatives are the same way. The only thing that is detected is the actual negative sample, uh, an RNASP probe in that for the human uh, reference control. So this gives an overview then of kind of our conti uh, continued development and expansion. Um, original testing kits, you know, you have quite a range in how these kits behave, how long they take, they were from an hour to five to six hours, depending on the platform. Um, the theoretical total samples per day, again, ranges widely because of the type of uh, assays they can be. Um, but typically, with one machine, you're typically at most probably getting around 720 samples a day. Um, all of these are single replicate assays, and the reaction volumes, again, vary quite widely. The amount of sample required varies quite widely. And the limits of detections also vary quite widely from the low end, 0.125, to the high end of five. 
Um, DNA's treatment to reduce false negatives is not necessarily included in most of those assays. And so these are the standard reagents um, that we'll be talking about. The platform that we've developed here um, to date is still in the five, uh, you know, six, six and a half hour range from beginning to end. However, the theoretical total number of samples per day with one machine doing staggered shift input on a 24 hour day can range anywhere from 1,800 to a little over 2,000 samples per day. Um, and this is not you know, running the machine at its maximum. The limits here are really due more to practical limits of plating that number of samples in the initial um, plating and extraction phase. Um, and there's less to do with um, what the machine can theoretically run through, which is closer to 6,000 samples per day when you're looking at the Biomark HD. We're running five replicates for every assay during the detection phase, and our reaction volumes are much lower. Limits of detection are on the low end to comparable to other assays. Um, we do do the DNA treatment, and uh, this reagent consumption in this research platform now is actually much lower than what you would have here. So you have a cost savings due to that. But what we're being told is this number of samples per day is not where we need to be and um, that we need to be higher. And so one of the ways that we are going to look at and are actually working on right now is a pooling approach where we can do four sample pools uh, on the same pipeline. The time expands a little bit because you're now having to make those pools. Um, but the number of samples that you can then run per day goes dramatically up. Um, whereas everything else in the assay stays the same and your cost then drops down even lower on a per sample basis. Now clearly everybody's also thinking about, well, what is that next leap? And the next leap really probably goes more to next gen sequencing. I haven't got it on here, but you could look at CRISPR pathway, you know, lots of additional new technologies that are on the board. But some of these take much longer. So your turnaround times for returning results becomes higher. Um, the number of samples that you need to have per run to make this cost effective is very high, which causes all sorts of logistical, how do you collect um, and process that number of samples efficiently. Um, and that's typically not something that's gonna be done in a traditional uh, clinical lab. Um, but this is a way to get to extremely low as well as extremely high numbers of samples that can be tested. And those, I'm, I'm sure that there are groups that are, are actively doing this at this point. This would be how we would be modifying this um, assay or how we are modifying this assay, which is to basically take and pool four samples um, per well in a 96 well plate, but everything else is essentially the same from that point on. You're really not having to change anything, and you do not take a large hit in our sensitivity by this sort of pooling approach. Where it changes is at the other end. Now, in, if you are negative, if a pool is negative, the results for all four individuals are reported as a negative. Whereas if you're a positive pool, you reflex test that pool back into one of our other clinical lab tests um, for a quick turnaround to identify the individual results for that. So using this approach, as I said, we can get up to 107 or 728 samples per run. And that also then if you do 10 runs per day, you're already up to seven over 7,000 samples per day, which for a clinical lab, um, that is actually a real, uh, really high throughput and uh, in its requirements. So talk, talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned during this implementation. Um, so we've got the EUA submitted. There's several EUAs that are all under review at the same time. Um, and, and we have no indication of when this EUA is going to be uh, approved at this point. Um, however, um, as we are implementing this into the clinical lab, there are some additional challenges that one does need to consider. First off, the first steps of sample plating can be daunting if you're doing this manually. 
And so adding robotics um, to that initial plating extraction steps to enable this clinical lab to more easily adopt this is being important. And this is something where we're working with a company called Opentron to do more of the sample tube to plating aliquoting. And this is especially true when we start trying to make pools. Um, it's much more efficient if we were to do this robotically than to try to do this manually. As part of the extraction steps, we're going to 96 well manifold uh, system. This is from Integra Biosciences, but that allows us to do whole plate pipetting as well as washes during the extraction step, both to reduce time and to make this um, less prone to um, carryover or wash. Um, all of, as we early on, we knew that the, all the later steps in the pipeline needed to use robotics, and we use the robotic uh, Integra Biosciences Assist Plus platform and their Voyager pipettes for all the other steps, including the loading of the integrated fluidic cell, which for those of you who have done that, it's a very small well, um, you know, on the order of 384 well, well sizes, and you know, you're loading four microliter of, of uh, sample into those wells. Um, this can be done very easily and very accurately by robotics. Um, compared to what any of our human technicians were able to do. Something else that we don't consider when we are doing robotic uh, or, or when we are doing uh, research platforms, at least not to the degree that a CAP CLIA lab does, is that part of their high complexity robotics checklist uh, leads it to a challenge where you have to always have uh, data about your carryover testing, drip testing, and water only tests. And, you know, we were, our assay was doing great when we were doing all by manual. And the robotics were doing very well, but we did identify pretty quickly when we started looking at some of these tests um, that there were some potentials for some um, uh, carryover, especially aerosolization if one does not do very slow pipetting in some of these steps. And that's hard to do manually but it can be achieved by robotic uh, integrations. Something else that became clear during these water tests is that we were starting to see some high cycle amplifications in at least one of our controls, our RNA-SP control. And we've since been seeing this also in the literature and the pathology um, message boards where other people are starting to see the same thing in a lot of other assays. And part of this is actually this non-specific amplification primer dimers. The amplification curves suggest that this is not actual logarithmic amplifications. Um, but these come up and, and you know, had to be um, assessed by the clinical group of whether or not they were or were not an issue. We also were seeing some rare human RNA-SP contamination, which did look like um, uh, real amplifications in our water-only controls. And we finally track this down to where we think it's part of our ethanol um, step um, where we were doing our extraction and that would purify or um, enrich any contamination. It's extremely low level. Um, it's very something though that had to be mitigated during this process. That has also prompted us to consider adopting a different uh, internal control using the MS2 phage instead of a human gene uh, as a spike in, as an internal extraction and RT inhibition control. This is a control that is used by many other systems, including the Fisher TAC path assays, um, and um, allows us to do uh, tests very accurately this internal extraction and RT inhibition. And so that is something that we're also currently looking at, and we'll use that to amend our EUA. Um, as appropriate or as directed by the FDA. So I want to point out that the real bottleneck here currently is not our test capacity, but is the ability for standardized sample collection, tube labeling, and availability of the digital patient data. You know, in Oklahoma, unfortunately, we still have a lack of interconnected health systems in the state that would allow us to consistently do this and load balance between different testing sites, depending on who was receiving a lot of samples to be tested at that particular point. And so that is one of our big challenges as part of our pipeline or of our system.
not as much of the capacity itself for an assay. Now, once we get that solved and we, if we continue to be told we need to be testing more than what we we're able to even here, then yes, we will be looking at adding additional systems or looking at other alternative technologies. But for right now, the research technologies do give us that increased capacity. So our ongoing development, our validation and bridging of the lab developed test to these four time forex pools um, and reflex testing of positives, expansion to more accessible and sustainable sample types, such as saliva, nasal, or throat washes, as well as then bridging of our extraction method, which is currently a spin plate to a lab source components using traditional guanidine isothionate, beta mercaptor ethanol, and magnetic bead purification. So I'd finally like to make and acknowledge all of the people that are part of this collaboration and made this possible. First off, the research and development group and the marketing group uh, at Fluidine, Dar uh, Mark Lynch, and, uh, as well as Chris Cabu and Naveen, uh, have been very instrumental and, very, and worked very collaboratively with us uh, to uh, develop this test. I have to thank uh, in my organization, President Prescott, and Dr. Judith James, the clinic, uh, Vice President of Clinical Affairs, because they basically enabled me to do whatever I needed to do to get uh, this technology uh, up and going and, and relocate equipment and whatever I needed. One of my uh, senior staff scientists in my lab, as well as uh, another senior scientist in uh, the Clinical Genomics Corps at OMRF, uh, were crucial for getting a lot of the actual testing and validation studies done, as well as then at the Health Sciences Center, um, the pathologist, starting with Dr. Talbert, Dr. Blakey, and Dr. McClowski, and Chris Williams, as well as a third-year resident who used to be a PhD student in my lab, um, who uh, was key because he could translate between the clinical pathology as well as the research. He had actually worked with the system with us as well as his uh, skills in programming of the limbs uh, and development actually of the limbs to be able to carry this on. And then the um, medical technologist um, at OU Medicine and they're ongoing now taking this and developing this further um, to integrate this with their staff uh, at that point. 